office at state headquarters and we'd be uh, trying to get our colleagues around the state to host an event at their station or work site. But as we all know, the current situation's meant we've had to do something different this year. And um, it's excellent that we've been able to pull together this webinar. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded so that our colleagues that, aren't, um, that are unable to watch it now, they can watch it at a later date. Um, so whether you are watching this live or at another time, thank you for your interest and for your involvement. Now, Men's Health Week, it's not just about the physical and mental health, um, and it's really about getting staff talking about their health and also about social connectedness, and it's, it's really important. I mean, obviously it's important that we continually promote men's health from a, a mental health perspective and a physical health perspective. But another really important piece of the puzzle is that social connectedness. Um, and it's important that as men that we have those connections and relationships and friendships that we can trust and rely on. And that brings us to the men's table. So I'd like to introduce Ben Hughes and David Poynton, who are the co-founders of the men's table. Um, ben and David are gonna take us through a presentation um, on the men's table and the important role it brings in helping men find social connections. So thanks, Ben and David. Thank you. Uh, I'm just changing my name there so you know which one I am. There we go. I'm Ben at the men's table. Um, very quickly about myself. So uh, as I've already established, I'm a POM. I have been here 29 beautiful years though. So uh, I'm almost Aussie. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, in, enjoy this place. I live in the eastern suburbs and uh, look, I've always had a bit of a social justice interest in doing things in community. Yeah, hi guys, I'm David. Uh, on the other half of the, uh, the, the dual team here, Ben and I were both part of um, the, the original men's table, which Ben will tell you about just in a minute. And at the beginning of last year, we decided to take what we'd been doing with other, some other men out to the wider community and we've been blown away by the interest and the growth and uh, so we're excited to share with you what we've been doing and what we've learned and some of the stuff about um, you know what men need and, and are responding to and I'll also be operating the, the controls here so I'm going to flick up the, the slide share now as Ben sort of kicks us off. <laughs> as Ben can't do that bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, this is our founding table. We are one of our spiritual homes is the Shaky in, uh, in Surrey Hills where we, we meet in the room and, and there we are, founding table. Now, bizarrely last night, we actually met, uh, was our, our, we were due to meet. So that was our ninth year. This table has been meeting. We've got 11 of the original 12 men who still meet. Uh, one of the guys there, the headshot there in the middle, he's actually moved to Launceston. So he Skypes in. Uh, and this is one of the ways that potentially we'll be able to do regional tables in the future. Um, the men's table came from, basically I was a member of a business networking group. Um, and at the end of one of the groups, I was talking to two of the guys saying, I'm, look, I'm pretty depressed. Um, life isn't going very well. I've been through a disastrous uh, divorce. I'm worried about my son. Self-employment is terrible. And they turned around to me and basically said, well, we know exactly how you feel because we feel the same way. And at that moment, I thought, I hear a lot of that. And what I realized was because I, I, I spill my guts all the time, I'm, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, confiding in me. I open the door and, and they kind of just walk through. So it's really showing that empathy. And I thought, well, there's, there's something here. So the next week at that meeting, I stood up and said, I'm going to start a men's group. Who's in? And uh, we started meeting in a private um, room in a restaurant in Surrey Hills on Crown Street uh, on the third Wednesday of every month. And we share the highs and lows of our lives, what kind of what goes on uh, for us. And we've really set up a, a, a beautiful community there. The beginning of last year, uh, David gave me a call and said I've, he's been prompted about doing some men's work. Um, what are we going to do about it? So we decided to roll the men's table out um, into the, you know, to open up more tables. Um, do you want to kind of take it on from there? Yeah, sure, Ben. Um, so the, the kind of, um, the, the quick summary of the men's table, I'm just trying to advance the slide here. Here we go. The quick summary of the men's table, it's, it's groups of about 12 men uh, who meet once a month over dinner. 
um, as Ben said, normally in a, in a public uh, private room of a, of a pub or a restaurant to share the highs and lows of, of their lives and how they're really feeling. Um, we've just done some research uh, supported by the Mental Health Commission and 95% of the uh, men at the now 18 tables told us uh, it's a safe place where they can share what's really going on and, be, and feel heard. Um, it's not just for the individual though, there's a sense of, of contributing to community. So the invitation is also that men who come to the tables are essentially stepping into men's work, into supporting other men, because by being part of the table, they're there to listen. Um, why men join tables? We've been hearing a lot of stories. If we ask men when they come, why, why have they come? You know, what, what are they hoping to, to get from it? Um, they tell us, uh, they don't really talk. They've got mates, but they don't, you know, they don't go very deep. Um, a lot of men um, may not say they're lonely, but there's actually a loneliness in their life. They don't have a lot of connect, uh, connectedness, and that's to Richard's point at the start. And they can be socially lazy. The partners are often the ones uh, doing the, the social organising. I noticed uh, Vicky uh, has joined the call. Um, and as, as the woman here on this call, it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on that, Vicky, when we get to a bit of a chat. Um, there's also sort of changing identities of being a man. Uh, the stereotype that we might have all been raised with is being kind of shattered or it's proving to be less useful. So what does it mean to be a man in the modern world? And, uh, and men do want to be part of a uh, community. So being, being heard and, and being a trusted community is the key thing in a sense of belonging. Um, what have men said to us specifically? We've heard these actual quotes and it's really helped shape our thinking about what we're doing. The one on the right, uh, one guy early on, he said, look, I've got mates, um, but we only talk about footy and shit. In other words, you know, there's a superficial level of the conversation that those mates uh, stay at. They don't go deeper. Um, another one said, I sit on the couch and listen to my wife on the phone, arranging a social life and I watch telly. This is that social laziness thing, that tendency to not be proactive. And when I went through my divorce, I looked around and found myself alone again. And we've heard lots of really, you know, quite, quite sad stories of men going through different transitions and finding that they don't have the support around them that they would ideally like to have. Um, and so, oh, that's yours, I think, Ben. Yeah, so this is, um, and I'm actually wearing the T-shirt now. Now we have T-shirts that say this. So, look, we, we, we you know, we're blokes. We go down the, the pub potentially and, and talk footy and shit. But what we offer men is something a bit deeper. We want, it's an, a distinct invitation for them to talk about their feelings. So, um, you know, it, we have a bit of a laugh. But when 7 o'clock comes is when we start. We really get into the, you know. The, the, what we're feeling, the highs and the lows of what's going on for us. We do the next slide. Richard, do you always do that? Have some canned ambulance siren in the background? <laughs> yeah, we just just like to have it as part of our webinars, just particularly for our guests. Good, love it. Um, so these are the stats, and um, you know, I'll just give you a moment to read those. Um, we have a bit of a table theme, so our graphic designer beautifully put these on napkins for us. I'm sure some of you know all know those stats already. Um, you know, it's a funny thing, the perception of, of men is that everything is okay. Um, but, you know, men don't really talk about what's really going on for them, but the stats will show you there is an issue out there. And by not talking about it, men can really help, you know, things will really build up in them and often come to crisis point, which can lead to depression, anxiety and suicide. So what we do is, is we support, we provide a kind of a support network of men sitting around a table to help them through these things. Go to the next one. So why is it that men don't talk about their feelings? Um, Hang on guys, I'll be back in a second. Okay. Someone slammed a trolley into the back of the, my vehicle. No worries Ian. <laughs> Life as it happens. <laughs> So why don't men talk about feelings? Um, you know, we've got an open group here. That m maybe, does anybody want, Carlos or Vicky, I don't know if you want to kind of have any insights on, on what that, why that might be. Vicky, I better open my video. I had the laptop shut before. I no apologize. Worries. I felt no like worries. a bit of a voyeur. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, 
I'm, I'm a psychologist by background. So sometimes I, and I've done a bit of private practice and I just thinking about with my clients, um, that's really the perspective that I've got and can put on. But I'd be interested to both the first hand and the gentleman on the line, maybe more first. Um, but I think what I noticed, some of the barriers with feeling comfortable is um, it's not that my male clients don't have necessarily the thought processes and the worries and the concerns and the fears. It's, um, I suppose, feeling okay and acceptable to open up about those. Um, and in my other life, I'm a mum of a little boy, so very personally invested to um, normalise and, and um, create an environment where right from the get-go, it, 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 it's not just accepted, but it's actually expected that we share and open up and talk about things. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm happy to jump in. I guess I grew up, my dad, um, I'm the youngest of four, and my dad was from the country, and he had quite a hard upbringing. And I know from a young age, I was told, you know, you don't, don't show your emotions or certainly don't cry, um, all those sorts of things. And I think that just becomes one of those expected things as you grow up that you just don't discuss your, your deepest, darkest feelings. Um, it's just unfortunately one of those things and we've certainly now that I'm a parent certainly in, encouraging my son and my daughter to to talk about how they feel but you know it it's certainly from a when I was in my teenage years and in my early 20s it certainly didn't talk about if I was having a bad day and upset or anything I, I certainly didn't share that with people right we uh, we've done a bit of research one of the things that always struck me about that research was there's a bit of research around restricted male norms like what it is to be a man and how that is a great indicator to ill health whether that be physical or mental just by being a man and the reticence to go to the doctor the reticence to talk about stuff is a great indicator for things potentially that, that you know that could go wrong um, should we flick it on to the next one? Just quickly, Ian and Carlos, anything you wanted to add about that question? Why do, why do you think men don't want to talk about feelings? Um, interesting enough, from, I think from an Ambo's point of view, you're being on the road, um, what you see, what you're dealing with, um, you turn around and you don't want to take it home with you and you shut it off. It's like when you go to a job, the humanitarian, oh, sorry, the, the, so the, the uh, feeling side gets shut off, gets pushed to the side. You go in, you do your job, treat your patient, pick your patient up, take them to hospital, come out, um, start to drop your guard, then you're back onto the next job and you just shut it all off and it goes into the, goes into the back. Mm. That's what I've found. Like I'm, I'm running 37 Yes. Um, so, and a lot of it's you don't take your work home with you. Or, well, you do, but you don't talk about your work because um, your family doesn't really want to, I don't think they want to hear about what you've gone through during the day and what you've, you've been dealing with. So, from uh, a lot of point of views, it's all held back. It's not released. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ian. Anything from you, Carlos? No pressure. Okay, well, we'll, we'll keep moving along here. Um, so I'm just gonna share screen again. Um, so I mentioned we did some uh, research. The National Mental Health Commission asked us to, uh, to you know, look at the model of care that we're operating with. And we did some literature scan and Ben's just referred to some of that, which is about restrictive male norms. We looked at um, other models. And then we asked our, our guys at tables, what's happening? What benefits are they getting? And we got some fantastic results. We were really blown away uh, at what they said. 95% of them said that being at a table, um, is a, it's a safe place to share. And one thing just to be clear is that the group becomes a closed group. They're a perpetual group. So it's not a drop in, drop out membership. As the, once the group's settled in their membership, it might take, you know, six months initially, for you know, the numbers to congeal around that magic dozen. 
uh, they become a, a closed group. And as Ben said at the start, last night, our table, nine years in, the trust and the safety that's there is really pal uh, palpable. Um, the ability to share feelings is related to that. And 80% of them told us that there's a mental health and wellbeing effect because of that. Uh, some come for the friendships and they feel, and we say you don't have to be best mates at a table, but um, the social connection is, is strong for uh, about 75% there. And also the sense of belonging to a community. And there is no doubt that being part of a table, as the, as the months and the years progress, there's a very strong sense that you're part of a community of men um, and it's not just about what's in it for you. And, and really neat outcome, about 60% told us that they are really seeing the benefits flowing on from uh, the table into their families and into their marriages and relationships with loved ones is their ability to be better listeners and to be able to talk more openly with others. Did you, is this one yours, Ben? Yeah. So how we made this a bigger thing was we went back to our original table and said, guys, what makes this work? Why have we been together? I think it was probably eight years at that stage, seven and a half years at that stage. What makes this work? And we asked them to write down a few pointers. And over the year and a half, we've kind of built a few things out. And this is just a very small sample of what we call the fundamentals. So the fundamentals is what keeps us ticking along and the table from not fracturing. The big one that every, I can guarantee you that everybody picks out is the no fixing. Men have a habit of wanting to fix uh, things, fix other men. So we allow men to talk without the fear of somebody stealing their story and trying to fix them. They can just come and talk. And there might be some advice offered if it's asked for, only if it's asked for. So, so I'm sorry, Vicky, but one of the things we do do is we work, we say peers before professionals. So we, we believe that, you know, with men's reticence to go to the doctor and, and talk to a professional quite often, if we get a group of peers in the room, they're more likely to open up. But they do have that habit of trying to fix. So we, we really do stop that from happening. We ask them to talk about their feelings. So it's a direct, it's not just a get together at a barbecue. It's a direct invitation to talk about how you feel. Now, there are two ways of talking where you can talk about your views. So if I talk about my views of the world, people can disagree with me. If I talk about how I feel about the world, I'm feeling like this about the world, then you're actually, people can't actually disagree with you because it's actually your feelings and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're real feelings. So we very much encourage that. You don't have to talk, you can just listen. So if a man had, a, has had something terrible happen to him, you know, two weeks prior, and he's busting to get to the um, get to the table. You know, and he's got this story to tell. If he's got eleven other men all listening to him, well, he feels heard. He feels like he has a place to to actually talk. Now, some of those other men don't need to talk. They they're just there to listen and support. We it's a, it becomes a closed group. Twelve seems to be the magic number. We ask men to attend nine out of the twelve meetings. Uh, every year by that you get consistency in the story we understand that you know there might be some family issues or something happening that you need to attend so you can't attend every single one and when the table gets to a certain point we ask them to grow to commit to grow old together so that was a very important thing because now nine years on I've got a group of friends and they're not all my best mates you know, there's some, some of them there I, I probably wouldn't go out for a beer with, but we meet once a month and we share our feelings and we're all in this thing together. So we've committed to grow old together. Um, and yeah, we, we've, it's been quite amazing. Last night was quite amazing. Nine years in on the third Wednesday of every month. So it's, we're building a community for men. That's what we're really doing. So the other things that came out of the, um, uh, of the research, um, these just sort of validate what we've already been saying, really. Um, you know, these are actual quotes, what men put into their surveys and so on, um, and, and reinforcing what we've already said. So there's a sort of an awareness and emotional literacy, in, um, emotional intelligence that can develop as well as men learn more. One of the examples, uh, men will often tell a story about what's happened, you know, the, the teenage daughter's done this or the wife's done that or, you know, my brother-in-law did this. And the story goes on. 
But we find even now, nine years in, sometimes we have to say to the man at the end of that story, but how does that actually make you feel? And that's helping him to, to get more in touch with those feelings and that, that emotional intelligence and literacy can, can develop over time. One thing we haven't talked about there is it's in the vault. So it's highly confidential what happens at the table. But to a certain point, because we know that when people go home, somebody will probably ask, ask them, well, what happened tonight? How did it go? And so we allow men to talk about certain stories without giving names away, et cetera, because that also helps them access some of their own feelings. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's in the vault to a certain extent. Um, we've grown considerably last year. We've got stymied a little bit by COVID, but we've got 18 tables up and running and we've got a couple in Sydney uh, due to form. So Balmain is very close to forming and, and one up in the, in the north in Taramara and Killara area. One in Perth, one in Launceston, one in Auckland, and the rest in Sydney and regional New South Wales. So we're, we're quite well, well spread. Um, David and I do this two days a week. So with, with more um, funding and some, you know, some more resources, we'll be, we'll be able to spread this out a lot further. Just one thing while these locations are on the screen too, we, we often like to say to people that it may not be for them. It may not, you know, Vicky, you obviously it's not for you, but everyone knows a man and you might know a man in one of these locations. We just look like having a table starting down in Melbourne as a result of uh, an introductory night we did on Monday night. And so people, you know, we know people around the place. So we, we just in, invite people and encourage them to spread the word and talk to men that you know. Uh, because there may well be a table either starting uh, near them or already underway that's still got um, vacant seats. And of course, uh, new men who come to us also tell us that they're, they're happy to start a table as well. Um, and just on that then, the, the best entry point um, and the, really the main entry point for new men coming in to find out more about how it works, we do a, a one and a half hour online and a two hour in person and uh, there's a couple of dates there. The, they're both with the same purpose. It's to paint a clear picture of how the table works and really go into the fundamentals, which are the, basically the guidelines of tables. We go into them in some detail, uh, but it's a very relaxed and conversational form. And uh, we also uh, do a little bit of practice. You know, we hear from each man, not necessarily his deepest, darkest thoughts, but we ask them, for example, why they come. We're often incredibly struck by how open men are and willing they are once we establish it's in the vault to share about you know, why they've come because of this happening in their life or because there's this gap going on. Um, it's, it's for men uh, to build friendships. It's not just for men who are you know, experiencing hard times or, or who have mental health issues, it's for all men. Um, so if anyone's interested, we'd certainly invite them to uh, go to our website and register. The, uh, the online one, uh, sorry, the in-person one at the Shaky Hotel in Surrey Hills, uh, it's, uh, the cost is $35 for a meal and a drink and the online one is, is $5, just so that people have got a bit of commitment and show up and, 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 and join us. So we invite you to both of those. And very quickly, there's no cost for the men's table. So there's no membership fee. Your only cost for you is your meal that you might have and maybe a beer or a glass of wine. So there's no membership fee. We don't get money that way at all. So maybe to finish off, if there's any questions or thoughts that you've got, any comments you'd like to make about what we've shared. No, uh, it's, um, and I think it's a step in the right direction. A lot of, well, I've been in 37 years. I'm up to the point where um, I'm heading towards retirement. And it's um, starting to make new friends out of the organisation. Um, you've got work colleagues. And as you said, that social situation is the one that you've got to break back into. And uh, the, I have a feeling that the men's, uh, you know, the table could be um, a way for guys who, like myself who are coming to the retirement age um, to start to go out, make friends. They can be able to talk about a lot of the issues that they've been through. And um, it's something that was touched on, uh, Richard, in the retirement uh, seminar that you did earlier last year for us old blokes who are over the hill. Um, it's something that we realise that you know, we might have the wealth, but we don't have the social attributes and the social contacts that we used to have when we were kids because of the job. We've become isolated. 
and we don't mix very well unless you're in amongst ambos. And you talk, and if you do go out, you do talk superficially about a lot of things like football, music, uh, and you don't really have. Uh, and I think it's the understanding that people who you talk to don't understand what you're actually going through um, because of the industry that we're in. Um, and I think sometimes you need that group to be able to open up and get some of the some of your baggage off your back. Mm. Uh, I'm a feeling that this will be a, a, a very good stepping stone, uh, right. getting getting out socially too. Great. Good on you, Ian. Anything quickly from you, Vicky? I know we're out of time. Um, I, I felt a little out of place when I first dialed in, but I'm very grateful that I have and that you guys let me be on the line and, and contribute. Um, I manage the peer support program at Ambulance. So for me, it, okay. this has been a wonderful um, session to get some insight in. Ian, I've loved your contributions as well because that is just so refreshing um, and mm -hmm. I think so important because it puts faces and names to people's stories and, and, and um, the challenges that are, are there and real and that I can't personally identify with. But um, I think continuing to be informed and educated around support groups and, and opportunities for people to connect like the men's table is so crucial um, to my place here at Ambulance. And thank you guys, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Well, oh, thanks, Vicky. And uh, back to you, Richard, but we really appreciate the opportunity to have joined and spoken with, uh, with you guys at the AMBOS. Yeah, no worries. Look, thank you to everyone for your time today, but particularly to Ben and David for uh, sharing the concept of the men's table. and. Um, as Ian, you alluded to, I think it's a, it's a great concept and one that we'll certainly promote um, within uh, our various resources at yeah. Ambulance. Um, and for those of us that are here, you know, I encourage you to, to get your colleagues to watch this webinar. Um, there'll be a link on the internet, so share that information with them with regards to the men's table. Um, she's not on the line, but I'd also like to acknowledge Zoe Wooldridge because she did help me um, with the technical skills with um, setting up the webinar, not my forte. Um, and as it is Men's Health Week, it would be wrong with me if I didn't say, um, if all of us try and make one small positive change, or whether it be physically, mentally, just, you know, those little small changes, they add up over time and, and you know, they may influence you to make further changes. So, uh, as always, Staff Health Team, we're here to help support you with your health and fitness goals. So, please feel free to reach out, um, either send me an email or give me a call and I can point you in the right direction. But, Otherwise, thanks again to everyone for your time and contribution and in particular to Ben and David again and um, have a great day. Right, right. thanks, Scott. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank Ciao. you. All right. See ya. Bye.